Up, down, hot, cold, inside, outside, war, peace, day, night, money, anti-money, water, fire, silence, noise, Resident Evil, Silent Hill, Doom, Quake, Pepsi, Coke, Xbox, PlayStation, matter, antimatter. It's common for things in this universe to have opposites. Likewise, as there is matter, there is antimatter, the opposite of mass. Arguably, the most volatile substance in existence. It will instantly annihilate as soon as there's another atom around it. A type of matter so explosive, it's rarely found in the natural universe, and it takes insanely high energy collisions of in particle accelerators to generate a few atoms worth. Nanograms have been formed so far if you add up all the antimatter ever generated. The cost of one gram of antimatter is estimated to be about $62.5 trillion and can only be generated in particle accelerators. The antimatter made in CERN's particle accelerator only amounted to a mass of about 1.6 nanograms as of 2023. In media and sci-fi, antimatter is treated like a super weapon, an extremely volatile and destructive material that poses a danger to anything or anyone around it. Able to turn the tide of a battle by itself and gives whoever controls it an immense technological edge and power. In today's video, we'll look at how antimatter is used or portrayed in the Expanse sci-fi novels by S.A. Corey and in Death's End, the third book in the Three Body Problem trilogy by Sishin Liu. In the Expanse, we'll see how the Laconian Empire loses a decisive battle to a few grams of antimatter. In the Three Body Problem's third book, Death's End, we'll go over how one person is able to nearly bring the entire solar system to its knees using antimatter bullets. After consulting with Naomi, Bobby and Alex head out on a mission to destroy the Tempest using what they learned from the transport freighter ship Intercept. This information reveals a blind spot in the Tempest sensor view that Bobby uses to sneak the White Crow close enough so they can send a small rocket with an antimatter bomb attached to destroy the Tempest. Unfortunately, Bobby's ship takes PDC damage upon approach. Bobby's co-pilot Rini Glauden is killed, but the antimatter bombs are untouched, saying that she will no longer be able to get the antimatter bombs close with the rockets they had. She takes a final measure of using her Laconian power armor's thrusters to accelerate the antimatter bomb towards the Tempest. The heart of the Tempest had stood alone against the combined forces of Earth, Mars, and the Belt, and won. It had put all humanity under Laconia's yoke. It was the living symbol of why all resistance against High Council Duarte would always be in vain. When their sensors finished, their override reset. It was gone. Alex cycled between numbness and grief with the regularity of a clock. When he could stand it, he watched the news feeds from around the system replaying the explosion. He hadn't been able to see because he was too close when it happened. The best one was from Earth. A handheld camera filming a child's kite competition was pointing at the right section of the sky when the light reached there, and the brightness against the blue had been like a small, brief sun, even at that distance. So in this scene, we see how the protagonists are able to destroy a Magnetar's class battleship, the most powerful type of ship in the known galaxy, able to dominate the entire solar system's defenses by itself. Magnetar class spaceships are centuries ahead in terms of technology. Their engines are powered by antimatter. Unable to defeat it in a straight fight, the protagonists manage to find a way to unleash a few grams of antimatter around it, causing its instant destruction. A few grams of antimatter were able to accomplish what the combined fleets of Earth, Mars, and the rest of the solar system were unable to. When Bobby releases the antimatter and it comes into contact with the Tempest, which is in orbit around Jupiter, it causes an explosion so big that it was visible from Earth during the daytime, momentarily becoming a second sun in Earth's sky. There are three books in Sishin Liu's Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy, also called the Three Body Problem series, after the name of the first book. The second book is Dark Forest, and the conclusion is Death's End, which is a wild adventure through space and time. In the third book of the Third Body Problem series, the protagonist Sheng Xin awakens from hypersleep to see what Wade has been up to while she slept. 
Little did she know that Wade, who had been left in charge of her industrial empire, had focused nearly exclusively on producing antimatter using the circumsolar particle accelerator. As part of his greater plan to develop faster than light travel, his goal was to give humanity an escape from the solar system for before the Trisolarians arrived in our solar system on their mission of conquest. Personally, I find the idea of a particle accelerator set up around the sun to be such a crazy out there idea for a solar system scale scientific mega project. Bi Yuanfang's voice was filled with pride. The circumsolar particle accelerator was not only used for basic research experiments, but also to produce antimatter. In the last four years, we've used it to make antimatter practically the entire time. We now possess 15,000 bullets of this design. The primitive seeming cartridge held in Wade's hand now caused Chang Xin to suffer chills. She now worried about the reliability of the containment magnetic field within that superconducting bullet. A single malfunction would be enough to cause the complete destruction of Halo City in a brilliant flash. She looked at the golden bandoliers hanging over the chest of every shoulder. These were the chains of the God of Death. A single bandolier possessed enough power to destroy the entire bunker world. Wade continued. We don't even have to go into space to attack. We just have to wait until the fleet approaches the city. We can shoot dozens, even hundreds of bullets at each of the 20 or so ships. A single hit is enough to destroy it. Although the tactic is primitive, it's effective and flexible. A single soldier with a gun is a fighting unit capable of threatening an entire warship. Also, we have agents in other space cities with handguns. He returned the cartridge to the soldier's bandolier. We don't want war. During the final negotiations, we'll show our weapons to the Federation envoy and explain our tactics. We hope the Federation government will weigh the costs of war and abandon their threat against Halo City. We're not asking for much, only to build a research center several hundred AU from the sun devoted to curvature propulsion testing. So Wade's plan relied on a simple antimatter bullet being able to take down an entire spaceship with just one shot. Since a bullet would have enough antimatter mass to deliver a large, incredibly powerful explosion, he knew that he could bring all of the solar system's spaceships and forces to defeat with just some troops and antimatter bullets. Wade hoped that the threat of weaponized antimatter would be enough to keep the governments of the solar system at bay, simply out of fear of the, of the destruction he could deliver with antimatter. Wade knew that the governments would come after him once they discovered that he had been researching faster than light speed trap, which was strictly prohibited. He knew that he would be the most wanted man in the solar system, so he made sure to stockpile antimatter bullets and train his troops before the solar government could catch wind of his plan. He hoped to keep him at bay so he could continue his research. Ultimately, it never came to that, since Sheng Xin decided not to force humanity to legalize the study of faster than light speed propulsion through coercion. Fortunately, Wade did produce one ship capable of faster than light travel. The first time a human built spaceship was capable of traveling faster than light through curvature propulsion, or traveling by collapsing the dimensionality of space in front of you as a way to accelerate a spaceship. This technology and spaceship would later be used by Sheng Xin and AA to escape the solar system after the dimensional strike when the solar system collapsed from three dimensions to two dimensions. Moving on to the science of antimatter. Antimatter is a form of matter that has the same mass as normal matter but with the opposite electrical charge. It is composed of particles called antiparticles. It is denoted by the prefix anti. For example, the antiparticle of an electron is a positron or the anti-electron. When matter and antimatter come into contact, they annihilate each other, releasing a large amount of energy, notably gamma rays. Antimatter is pretty rare in our universe. With normal matter, when particles of the same type get close to each other, they repel because they'll have the same electrical charge. So as they get closer, the repulsion gets stronger. But with antimatter, that repulsion inverts and becomes attraction. So a particle will accelerate and slam into its antimatter partner. And this force will increase the closer they get to each other. Since the electrical attraction gets stronger the closer the particles get, they end up crushing into each other releasing tons of energy through the conversion of mass to energy, E equals mc squared. Not too dissimilar from some of the basic concepts in nuclear power. But since comparatively more mass is converted to energy, far more energy is released than in a nuclear reaction. Where, compared to antimatter, there is relatively little conversion of mass to energy. 
antimatter was first postulated by British physicist Paul Dirac in 1928. He was working on the theory to describe the behavior of subatomic particles and found that his equations predicted the existence of particles with the same mass as electrons but with opposite charge. Dirac was trying to find a solution to Schrodinger's equation that would account for the relativistic effects of particles traveling very fast. The resulting re equation factoring relativity into Schrodinger's equation is called Dirac's equation. Dirac's equation resulted by applying some of the concepts of special relativity to Schrodinger's equation, and one of the solutions to this equation suggested the existence of an electron but with opposite charge. The discovery of the positron, or the anti-electron, was confirmed experimentally by American physicist Carl Anderson in 1932, who observed the characteristic gamma rays produced during the annihilation of positrons and electrons. In cloud chamber photographs, he noticed the trajectory of particles with the mass of electrons but with the opposite trajectory, as if they had the opposite charge but with the same mass. This was the first experimental evidence for the existence of antimatter, and it marked the beginning of the scientific study of this mysterious substance. In the early universe, it's believed that matter and antimatter were produced in nearly equal amounts, keyword here being nearly equal. More matter was produced. The exact reason for this imbalance between matter and antimatter is still not fully understood and is one of the open questions in physics. One possibility is that there is a tiny difference in the behavior of matter and antimatter particles that led to an unequal distribution of both being created in the early universe. However, something did cause a slight imbalance, leading to an excess of matter over antimatter at the Big Bang during the creation of the universe. This excess of matter is thought to be the reason why the universe today is composed almost entirely of matter with only tiny amounts of antimatter. This matter and antimatter imbalance at the Big Bang is another mystery that will likely puzzle scientists for decades if not centuries to come. Despite the relative rarity of antimatter, scientists have been able to produce small amounts of it in particle accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. A particle accelerator is a type of scientific instrument used to accelerate subatomic particles to very high speeds and energy, and then collide with a target to produce other subatomic particles, such as antimatter or high energy photons. A recent example is the experimental conformation of the Higgs boson. Particle accelerators can take many forms, but the biggest, most powerful ones generally consist of a series of electromagnetic fields that accelerate particles to high speeds and steer them along a particular path. In the case of the highest energy particle accelerators, that path would curve along itself into a circle. Particle accelerators are often built underground for several reasons. First of all, radiation shielding. Particle accelerators produce high energy particles and radiation as byproducts of their operation, which can be harmful to humans. By building underground, the Earth acts as a natural shield against this radiation, protecting both the environment and people nearby. Second, stability. Building a particle accelerator underground provides stability against the vibration, ambiental noise, and disturbances that can occur above ground, such as ground vibration from nearby traffic, noise from nearby towns. These vibrations can interfere with the delicate measurements and experiments that take place within the accelerator. The particles accelerated within an accelerator are often traveling at near light speeds, and any interference from any other source can disrupt the beam and the experiments that depend upon it. By placing the particle accelerator underground, it is shielded from cosmic rays and any other sources of background radiation that could interfere with the beam or measurements. And lastly, space requirements. Particle accelerators can be very large. Building them underground provides the necessary space while taking valuable surface area. Overall, building particle accelerators underground provides a controlled and stable environment that is ideal for conducting experiments with high energy particles. The particles are typically generated by an electron gun, which emits a stream of electrons or by ionizing a gas or solid material to produce a beam of charged particles. Electron beams have heated filaments that will generate a flow of electrons when heated in a vacuum. They're also used in industry for coating or etching. I personally use e-beams in grad school to evaporate material that will form thin film structures, where you could place your material in an evaporation cup and heat it with a curved electron beam that travels through a magnetic field. You could change the magnitude of the magnetic field to control the, the electron beam and what is being targeted. Particle accelerators are used in fundamental research to study the behavior and properties of subatomic particles and to search for new particles that may be produced at very high energies, such as those particles that would have existed at the beginning of time at the Big Bang. 
In the Three Body Problem series of novels, the invading aliens, Trisolarians, deploy Sophons to Earth, which are single proton mobile computers. They are sent to stop human scientific advancement by interfering with the data reported from Earth's particle accelerators, preventing any further breakthroughs in quantum or particle science. CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, is one of the leading institutions in the world for the production and study of antimatter. CERN has several particle accelerators, such as the Large Hadron Collider, that are capable of producing high energy particle beams that can create antimatter particles, and is the highest power particle accelerator on Earth with capacity of up to 6.8 tetraelectron volts per beam. The Large Hadron Collider (LHC) it is located near Geneva, Switzerland, and is operated by the European Organization for Nuclear Research (CERN). The LHC is designed to accelerate protons and heavy ions to almost the speed of light, and then collide them together, producing new particles that can be studied by the physicists. The collisions take place in four main detectors, Atlas, CMS, LHCB, and ALICE. The Large Hadron Collider is a circular tunnel that is 27 kilometers, about 17 miles, in circumference and located 100 meters or 330 feet underground. And it uses powerful magnets to steer a beam of particles around the ring and radio frequency cavities to accelerate them. The Higgs boson was first observed by the Atlas and CMS detector at the Large Hadron Collider in 2012. Its discovery confirmed the existence of the Higgs field, a crucial piece of evidence supporting the standard model of particle physics. One of the ways that antimatter is produced at CERN is through the collision of high energy particles with a target. When these particles collide with the target, they can produce antimatter particles that are detected and studied. The production of antiparticles at CERN is a relatively rare event, and a significant effort is required to collect and store small amounts of antimatter that are produced. In addition to producing antimatter, CERN also has facilities for studying the properties and interaction of antimatter particles. These studies are helping scientists to better understand the nature of antimatter and its relationship to normal matter. CERN's work on antimatter has important implications for our understanding of the universe and the fundamental laws of physics. The study of antimatter can help answer questions about the origin of the universe, the nature of dark matter and dark energy, and the behavior of matter and energy at extremes, in very high energy environments and in at very small scales. Even if CERN uses accelerators for only making antimatter, it could produce no more than about one billionth of a gram per year. To make one gram of antimatter would take about one billion years. The cost of antimatter is extremely high, and the efficiency of antimatter production and storage is very low. About one billion times more energy is required to make antimatter than is fully contained in its mass. One gram of antimatter contains roughly 25 million kilowatt hours of energy. Taking into account low production efficiency, it would take 25 million billion kilowatt hours to make just one gram. And that would cost more than a million billion dollars. So like, infinite money. Producing antimatter is hard enough. Storing it is a completely different matter. For any usage as a weapon, fuel, or energy source, antimatter would need to be stored in a stable environment until needed. Generally in sci-fi, this is managed through magnetic fields with batteries on them that are able to contain antimatter, pushing it away from regular matter to prevent it reacting. Therein lies the challenge, storing it, without it being able to interact with nearby matter. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and like and subscribe if you like this type of content. Any support is appreciated and it really helps out a small growing channel.